the story of the Tower of, of Babel, where they say, we want to make a name for ourselves. Right. And, and God says, no, that's not going to happen. In the very next chapter in Genesis 12, God says to Abram, I will make your name great. Mm -hmm. You know, I will. He wants that for us. But he says, but, but do it this way, not in your own way. You can, you can be a representative of the poor in lots of ways. I mean, this is the position mm -hmm. that I've had, um, but not actually experience the pain and the, right. the, um, the marginalization. Hello, welcome to the Upwards podcast. I'm Susan Anderson, senior writer at Upper House. Today, I am delighted to have a conversation with Aaron White. He's an advocate for befriending people on the margins, and he brings honesty and vulnerability to this conversation. He speaks with the heart of a pastor, a Christ follower, a parent, and friend. He's also written about living a beatitude life. He digs into what it means for him and maybe for us to truly live out what Jesus spoke about in the Beatitudes. For himself, he lives in a tough neighborhood. Sometimes he gets a lot of attention for that, but most importantly, he loves that neighborhood and its people. We talk about that love, the Beatitude mindset, the challenge of it, and the possible results of practicing a more honest form of hospitality. I know I was both challenged and blessed by this conversation with Aaron, and I hope you are too. So I loved your biography, partly because it gave me some sense of your passion and your heart, but what it lacked was telling to me as well, and that is you didn't go into your position, your status, your degrees. Um, it's like you parsed all of that stuff out. And I wanted you to mention a little bit of your rationale for that, because I think that will tell us a lot about who you are. Yeah, I mean, I, I've been doing this for a while. And I've been speaking in lots of different places for a lot of years. And I didn't even used to have a picture. I was right. back in the days when they said, please send a picture. And I didn't have a picture of myself. So I, a couple of different conferences, I sent a picture of Vin Diesel <laughs> instead. <laughs> and they, and I think one conference in particular, they did use it. And so uh -huh. I think people were a little disappointed when they showed up to <laughs> my talk. Is that because of your like rock and roll look or... Yeah, a little bit. Particular. I mean, when I, I have a really big beard, when I don't have a big beard, I actually look a lot like Vin Diesel, weirdly. Oh, okay. And I, I don't know if that's a compliment to me or an insult to him. But <laughs> I, yeah, the 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 bio thing, um, I'm just kind of over it. Like, I mm. think that we are playing the world's game mm -hmm. when we are trying to show, yeah. here's why you should listen to me, because I've accomplished yeah. this and I've done that. When I when I look, one of the things I love to do when I introduce myself, particularly when I'm speaking, is I like to spend, if I have time to do it, the first five to ten minutes talking about my grandmother huh. and where she came from. Because when I look biblically at the introduction of people, right. often it's more you're the son of and the daughter of, and you came from this tribe and this nation and this place. It's true. And that's how a lot of my indigenous friends also introduce themselves. Mm. They don't talk about their accomplishments they talk about their relationships fascinating and so when you go and speak at these events you're often really encouraged you know or even pressured to say here's why people should listen to me is all these accomplishments mm -hmm. but i know mm -hmm. enough people with enough accomplishments who i don't particularly want to listen to you yeah. know i i'd like to get to know somebody so i just i try as much as i can in every way possible to subvert those expectations because i don't think they're helpful i think they're actually yeah. harmful to us as people as individuals as a presenter as people listening uh, and mm -hmm. and as a whole culture i don't think they're helpful well as i think about it i think they're distancing right yeah they they definitely elevate status and they also create a sense of distance between yourself and the people you're actually wanting to connect with. That's right. right. And connection is a very big part of your um, discussion at KJS and I'm assuming in your life mm -hmm. because you in your bio mentioned that you've moved to this neighborhood in Vancouver, which sounds like it's actually a pretty tough neighborhood. And that you're seeking not only to love, but to be loved by. 
mm-hmm. your neighbors. And that to me was so interesting because I think we, at least in the conversations I've been a part of, talk about loving our neighbors and kind of as an act of charity, yep. <laughs> if you will. But to be loved by your neighbors takes it to a whole different level. So I'm wondering what your experience has been like in terms of establishing relationships as a Christian, as a Christian leader as well, um, that kind of takes it a deeper step than I think a lot of us really talk about in our church experience. Well, you mentioned the, the word distancing, and, and quite often our degrees and our positions and our structures can just be inherently limiting and distancing, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, even to the point where there are there are places where I've worked where or or I've known other people have worked where they say you have to sign a document saying you will not fraternize mm-hmm. with people outside of the workplace. That is, you're working wow. say in a shelter or in a mm-hmm. detox or a treatment center or something like mm-hmm. that, and you're helping people. Mm-hmm. Who are coming in, and you are genuinely helping people, but you have to mm-hmm. sign a document saying you won't go out afterwards and have coffee with that person. Right. And I understand the reasons for that. I do because I've seen uh-huh. it. I've seen abuse yeah. happen. I've seen manipulation happen. And there is an inherent power dynamic that exists, and we have to be really aware of that and really mm-hmm. careful about those things. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. But I yeah. just choose not to live my life like that. I think those places and those ideas have to probably be there for now, but I would like Mm -hmm. us to try and be working our way out of those because Mm -hmm. I've seen the most transformation happen in me when I have been open to somebody speaking into me. And that, Mm -hmm. that really doesn't happen when I'm in a service provider place and Mm someone in a client and reception of of provision Mm -hmm. place. So we chose early on that we were going to try and be different. There was enough of that dynamic mm-hmm. already in our neighborhood. So we weren't against, we're not against people who, who are giving out food, you know, at all. But yeah. we would rather be in the place of, rec- in that lineup receiving the food than giving mm-hmm. it out. Um, you know, when we mm-hmm. do our meals in our local environment, it's, we cook together and we eat together and we clean together to try and remove as much as possible that dynamic of, person giving charity, person receiving charity, um, because we're all actually receiving. And that's, yeah. I think, the, the offer and the invitation from God yeah. is to receive and to give. And when we don't have that mindset, I think it becomes a patronizing, power dynamic relationship, which ultimately is not transformational. Um, right. It's ultimately going to reinforce the same kinds of hierarchy and mm-hmm. structure that has has led to a real disconnection in our society. Right. Well, you mentioned something really critical, which is the fact that we've all received charity, we've all received mercy, we've all re- received grace mm-hmm. from this amazing God that we love. And do you think part of the reason that we rely so much, though, on status and accolades or whatever it is that we like to put in our resumes is because we don't really fully realize that? I think we don't we don't realize it, experience it, or trust it. Mm-hmm. So I, I think back to Genesis when, uh, you know, the story of Cain and Abel, and Cain has killed his brother, and mm-hmm. he has this interaction with God, and, mm-hmm. and, and he says, you have to go, and Cain says, but they're going to kill me. If mm-hmm. I go, people, whoever is out there is going to kill me. Right. And God says, mm-hmm. no, I'll put a mark on you. And we think now, this is how messed up we are. We think the mark of Cain is like this evil mark, but actually right. it's God's protection over mm-hmm. Cain. He says, don't worry, I'll protect you. But Cain doesn't believe it. Mm-hmm. And, and Cain goes and builds a city. That's what it says. And there's a, a beautiful book uh, by Jacques Ellul called The Meaning of the City, where he talks about every huh. instance of the building of cities throughout scripture until the very end, where it's not a positive thing. People are building these cities in order to try and create the kind of safety, in order to create Mm -hmm. the kind of provision, uh, in order to create the name for themselves that God actually wants for us. Mm. Um, You know, there's the the story of the Tower of of Babel, where they say, we want to make a name for ourselves. Right. And and God says, no, that's not going to happen. In the very next chapter in Genesis 12, God says to Abram, I will make your name great. You know, I will, he wants that for us, but he says, but, but do it this way, not in your own way. Right. So I, I think that a lot of those things are about protection and it's mm-hmm. about not ultimately trusting that God 
-hmm. God's love and mercy and hospitality to us is real. Mm -hmm. And so we feel we have to protect ourselves in it. And mm -hmm. so I think it's a very big danger. Right. And the idea of the city is also kind of aligned with the idea of a fortress. So mm -hmm. we cloak yeah. ourselves, we cloak our, our communities in these buildings, right? right? And these buildings become our, our point of contact, but aren't necessarily the point of relationship. Yeah, and even more, it's it's our system, it's, it's our buildings, but it's also our systems and our structures. It's mm -hmm. our nonprofits, it's our charities, mm -hmm. it's our boards, it's it's our mm. organizational flowchart. You know, it's mm -hmm. our it's our legacy that we're trying to leave. It's our fundraising. Mm -hmm. All these things exist, and I'm not saying they're inherently bad. I'm just saying right. we have to be careful that we're not serving those things, mm -hmm. because in the end, ultimately. Um, and the experience of many, many people who have gone through um, helping programs mm -hmm. is that ultimately the program exists to help the program. And, and incidentally, yeah. it helps people, and it does. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. really, there's a lot of the, the, the policies and the programs exist in order to help the people running the programs. And so we have to be very careful around that, th that stuff. Well, and I think part of it, too, is... In our country, you're in Vancouver, so I'm not sure how it is there, but here there's so much concern about liability. Of course, like are you going to be ser are you going to be served a warrant or a court yeah. order someday for something that you didn't even know was wrong or yeah. had no intention of committing anyway? Yeah. So there's a lot of fear underlying Absolutely. a lot of these interactions, and um, I wonder if you could describe a little bit of your work with people who struggle with addiction. Yeah, um, and it's it's funny even to talk about my my work now with people. So I've been a pastor, and I've worked in treatment centers, and I've I've done a lot of that kind of thing. And now, more the work that I do is people will call me, and I'll go for a walk, huh. and and they will, you know, lay out stuff that's going on in their heart, and I'll lay out stuff going on in my heart, and we'll kind of bless each other. Or you know, I brought mm. a friend of mine to the Kingdom Justice Summit. And yeah. we ended up, because we got stuck in Dallas because of a certain airline that I won't mention, um, <laughs> you know, we ended up spending a yeah. whole day of travel and a whole day stuck in the Dallas Fort Worth airport and just spent mm -hmm. time together and deepened our friendship. Mm -hmm. um, when we have meals together, you know, we may have up to 60 people having a meal together. But again, it's it's uh, people have come in and they, they help cook the meal and then they clean up okay. and, and it's a community. Mm -hmm. And so what we've discovered now is not that we don't need treatment programs because there are treatment programs can be very, very good, mm -hmm. very, very helpful. And we will mm -hmm. help people get into those and we'll walk alongside them in them and we'll mm -hmm. be there afterwards. But we have discovered quite a number of people who um, don't need a treatment program because what they actually needed was connection. Right. They actually needed was something to do in the day and mm -hmm. people to do it with and people who knew them, knew their names, cared about them. And and they might even still drink every now and again, mm -hmm. but they're no longer enslaved to this thing, which was actually a replacement for the kind of connection that they longed for. So we've seen a number of people in that place right. where it just, you know, it just looks different because we're, we're doing life together. And we so some mm -hmm. people really, really need a program. Other people just really, mm -hmm. really need friends. And actually, all of us really, really need friends. So my focus now is far more on, on being that friend because there's lots of programs and mm -hmm. seemingly a shortage of friends. Right. So that's what I'm trying to do. I agree with that completely. Um, there was a quote that one of my colleagues brought up that he wrote down during your talk um, last weekend. He said, the opposite of addiction is not sobriety, it's connection. Mm -hmm. And what you're doing is living that out simply by eating together, taking walks together, doing dishes together. Mm -hmm. um, so at what point did you decide that your call was to speak about this type of stuff? How did you become a speaker and a writer <sighs> talking about these things? Yeah, I mean, I've I've been so I've been invited to do different types of speaking for probably the last twenty years, um, mm -hmm. and part of that was uh, living where we live, and mm -hmm. so people were interested in that. And I think there was a lot of invitations that happened because 
people wanted to hear the the war stories, the romanticized mm. war stories of, of where we live. Can you describe briefly what it's like, where you live, what it is like? Yeah, there, well, there's lots of there's lots of phrases that are used to describe our neighborhood. Either, you know, some mm -hmm. people call it uh, 10 square blocks of hell, poorest postal code mm. in North America, that kind of stuff. But we really just call it home. It mm -hmm. is, though, the center yeah. of the, the most overdoses, I think, in, the, in North America on a regular wow. basis. Um, incredible levels of poverty, but also incredible levels of gentrification. So oh. people are, are homeless and it's desperately <sighs> poor here and they can't afford a single room in our neighborhood because it's been, the prices have been jacked up. So it's just a whole series yeah. of tensions and difficulties uh, in our neighborhood. So it, it can be quite difficult. And um, we will, I will often, when I walk around in the neighborhood, find someone who is, looks like they, they might not be alive. And we have to go and make sure that, you know, the, the ambulance attends and my children are in the same place. They have to make sure that, you know, people that they see, they know how to check if they're alive and what to do in the case that someone's not breathing kind of thing. That's our neighborhood. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you hear that and people go, well, I want to hear what you have to say. And, uh, but I, again, I, I started to think, well, is that really a good reason to just listen to somebody? Um, I wrote the books because I was asked, there was a group that wanted to put together a, a series on how to pastor well, and they wanted to somebody who could write about how to pastor someone through addiction and recovery. Mm. And they wanted someone with a PhD, which I don't have. Um, but they couldn't find anybody with a PhD and, and also practical, you know, Jeez. pastoral yeah. engagement. I'm sure they're out uh -huh. there, but they didn't, or maybe who could also write. So somebody knew me who knew somebody else. And so they asked if I would do it. So, so I said, I don't really want to write about just a, how to pastor a person through that. What I'd like to write about is how to how to create or be involved in the kind of beatitude community that Jesus invites us into, mm -hmm. which actually might be the answer to those things that lie underneath addiction and not just mm -hmm. addiction to drugs and alcohol, but our whole attachment scenario to all kinds of things, uh, whether right. it's our political or our economic or our social or all kinds of things that we are attached to in really unhealthy ways. So how do we, how do we uh, navigate through that? So that's mm -hmm. that's a lot of how I've got to be, you know, communicate and and write. So you mentioned something earlier about people liking to hear the horror stories, and um, I think that's actually something so common just anymore with our media always focusing on the worst, and we get kind of addicted to the vicarious, like ooh, kind of experience of viewing those things, but can you speak to how you have developed really genuine relationships in your community and that feel natural to you that aren't anything about you serving so much as just being the person you are with the people you're surrounded by? Well, I say to my, my friends a lot, like, I'm, I'm your friend because you, you wanted to be my friend. Mm -hmm. There's lots of, I mean, I've met lots and lots of people and I'm friendly mm -hmm. with lots and lots of people, mm -hmm. but I'm not friends with lots and lots of people. So there mm -hmm. are people who I've reached out to, or they reached out to me and there was then the reciprocation. There was a mutuality. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And sometimes those started in kind of weird places, weird ways. And then eventually they turned into just genuine friendship. Mm -hmm. But I'll, I want to tell about uh, a man I know named Tony, who. He came down to the downtown east side, I think probably about 15 years ago, and he asked, what can I do? And we have lots and lots of people, Christians and non-Christians, coming mm -hmm. to the downtown east side saying, what can I do? How can right. I help? And they usually think, what is, you know, what can I give? You know, how can I serve? Mm -hmm. All this kind of stuff. And I always say, and a number of us down here always say, could you make a friend? Huh. And mostly people go, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. But what? What can I also like really do? But mm -hmm. Tony just said, oh, I can do that. And he just found a guy mm -hmm. who's a very difficult person to be friends with in a, in a way and just became his friend. And then for the next 15 years, he was his friend and he would come down every day and he would find him and he would be his friend, take him everywhere, whatever they did in the neighborhood. If Tony was helping mm -hmm. serve food or whatever, his friend was there with him. He was wow. always there with him until his friend passed away. And mm. then he just really deeply mourned and lamented the loss of his friend. And mm. that's not a story that you're going to write a book about. 
but that was a life-changing friendship for both of those men. Mm. And if we could just all do that, mm -hmm. I'm not sure how many of the programs we would need. Mm -hmm. Because you fight right. differently for your friend. You advocate differently for your friend, mm -hmm. you know. I, mm -hmm. We almost got, we got in trouble because we would bring our friends in to sometimes sleep on our couch. And we're told we can't do that for liability reasons. And my pushback was, well, it's my couch and it's my friend. Am I allowed to have my friend in my house? Mm -hmm. And I said, mm -hmm. yeah, you are. I said, well, then what if they happen to be homeless? <laughs> you know, like, are they allowed mm -hmm. in here? So so I think there's that level of... of um. You know, I think we all know what a friend is like. I hope. Maybe maybe right. we don't. I don't know. Right. But if we know that, then we just need to broaden the possibility of that inclusion, of that definition of friendship mm -hmm. to people who aren't necessarily always like us in every way or fit some of the categories that we would normally associate with friends. And I think mm -hmm. if we can do that, we can really start to transform our own lives and the lives mm -hmm. around us. Well, there's a difference between loving your neighbor kind of as an abstract con concept or like looking across the fence at somebody else and like occasionally interacting with them and doing what you do, which is to invite somebody in to sleep on your couch, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And um, I think about the way I was raised, which was that would not have ever happened. You know, safety was too big of a factor in our lives. And I'm wondering, what does it take for us to get over our fear of tr taking that risk? And how do we judge if it's a wise risk? We, we've often said, when I, when I do speak in churches or places, I don't uh -huh. say the first step is to go and find uh, <laughs> the person who's just come out of prison. Like, maybe that's, <laughs> yeah. you know, there are, you know, well, well I'll do that. But, like... What I often give the challenge to is, is um, can you find somebody in your church who you don't know mm. or maybe is lonely and arrange to cook a meal with them? Mm -hmm. you know? And ideally sit down and say, what kind of food do you like? And can we go and buy the food together? And then we'll sit mm -hmm. down and we'll cook the meal together and we'll eat it together. Mm. Just start there. Just start mm -hmm. like, building up our muscles for actual mm -hmm. hospitality, which mm -hmm. isn't a show. It's not performative. It's come mm -hmm. and join with me. And then maybe I'll, maybe next time we'll go over to your house and mm -hmm. we'll do it that way. And you just start to learn. And then maybe after a little while, we'll invite another friend, you know, to, to come in and be part of that. Right. And I, it's in some ways, it's quite sad that the church, uh, that that feels and often is received as quite revolutionary. Mm -hmm. When, I think even the even even though the church doesn't have a really great name right now for lots of reasons, say in, mm -hmm. in the West, I think people would assume that that's what's already happening in the church mm -hmm. and, and is in many churches, of course. But mm -hmm. but, you know, I think that's actually something we have to relearn because we have become so beholden to the culture of individualism and separation exactly. and disconnection. Exactly. That, you know, we're not even... We're, we're, we're agreeing with things that are not biblical and saying, well, that should take the highest priority mm -hmm. rather than saying, no, actually, this notion of kinship, this notion of, of my family extends beyond the nuclear, extends beyond the blood tie, right. you know, mm -hmm. uh, okay, what does that mean? What, how mm -hmm. should we then live? I don't think we're mm -hmm. actually letting ourselves be confronted by that invitation. Mm -hmm. from Jesus mm -hmm. into a better way of life. And it is a blessing. It, that's kind of the whole point is that it's not a burden. Right. It's not, oh, I got to do this duty. This is actually a good way to live. Um, right. But it, we do have to lay down a lot of things in order to get there. So. There's so many thoughts going through my head right now. One of them is a personal experience I had not too long ago where I went to a friend's house and she is a, such a, a model of hospitality to me. And, um, you know, we had our talk and we were, you know, eating her cheese and crackers and all of that. And then she looked at the time and goes, oh, I have somebody who's coming to stay with me. Can you help me make the bed? And in that moment, I felt like I was really part of her life. Mm -hmm. It was so interesting to me. I'm like, this is like the best afternoon I've had in a long time. And it was because she invited me to do something that 
well, you know, I didn't, I didn't expect it for one thing, but mostly it was just because she invited me to be part of her messy, not so messy in a lot of ways, but into her real everyday experience. And there was no show involved. There was no like, everything in my world looks perfect and is perfect. It was just, this is who I am. This is what I need to do. Can you help me? Mm -hmm. And it just, in a way, deepened my um, relationship with her, just doing that one simple thing. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like I'm making a big deal out of it, but it was really meaningful to me. So um, I really appreciate that suggestion of what can you do that makes it less about, I don't know, making a show out yeah. of hospitality, which is, I think, what I was trained to do. Like you have everything perfect, your house is perfectly cleaned, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and there's so much bondage in that that often I end up not inviting people over just because I don't want everybody to see the reality of my mess. Yeah. So, um, and Jesus is living with us in our mess all the time. Mm -hmm. The real person, the people who are making us feel like this, it, it's not God, you know, mm -hmm. it's self-imposed. Yeah. So that's one thought I had mm -hmm. while you were talking. Um, the other one I had was something I've been reading in Luke. I've been reading through Luke 14 this the last couple of days, and Jesus is really um, challenging everybody in his presence about um, thinking carefully about what is real and what it takes to do the important things involved in following him, for example, which is to be mindful of the people around you no matter where you are and to build your life wisely and thoughtfully and not to just do things on automatic pilot. That is my very poor you know, um, summary, which we can redo later if you want to, but, um, I'd ask you to comment on what I'm going to read here. Mm -hmm. Um, he's at a meal with the Pharisees and he's obviously being carefully watched and he's observing people taking the higher places at the table and trying to position themselves in the social gathering. And, he very directly says to the host, when you give a luncheon or dinner, do not invite your friends, your brothers or sisters, your relatives, or your rich neighbors. If you do, they may invite you back, and so you will be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed. Although they cannot repay you, you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. And I think you're kind of filling out what Jesus is intending here with the way you talk about hospitality, but is that part of your thinking as well, that Jesus invites us to think about everybody around us? Yeah. And I mean, I think anytime Jesus is, is using parabolic or metaphorical language, in this case, mm -hmm. it's just an example, but, you know, he, mm -hmm. he's speaking about himself as well. Mm -hmm. So... So this hmm. is part, I think this is part of the story of who am I inviting? Mm -hmm. You know, who, who is being invited in? And we have a number of, number of stories from Jesus's life where he said, I'm inviting the really unlikely here. Hmm. I'm inviting mm -hmm. the ones who don't expect the invitation. I'm inviting the ones who mm -hmm. know that they can't host a feast in return. And so, you mm -hmm. know, you can read that passage a little bit and go, well, oh, I guess we shouldn't have our friends over. Just, you should just do the charity meal. You know, you should do the soup kitchen kind of thing. And I don't think that's what's going on there. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's, you know, don't just be caught up in this, um, this tit for tat kind of, you mm -hmm. know, it becomes almost a social climbing, mm -hmm. you know, socially expected kind of dinner party thing. And, and Jesus is like, that's not even what God is doing here. God is not mm -hmm. doing the thing that you expect. Um, mm -hmm. God is opening things up to the people who, who really have been, um, you know, kept out. I, I was reading the other day this this passage where Jesus, you know, meets the lepers, and mm -hmm. and the he he says to the leper after he heals him, "Don't tell anybody." And the right. leper, of course, goes and tells everybody. And and I hadn't realized this before. This was a new revelation that uh, 
the leper was finally able to go into the town. Right. He would have been kept out of the town. So Jesus's healing of this man was social and spiritual and physical. Mm -hmm. There was all there was every level of connection. Mm -hmm. But because this leper went into the town and disobeyed and told everybody about Jesus, mm -hmm. now it says the next line says, and Jesus now couldn't enter the towns. Right. And and it, I had always taken that as, well, he became too famous, but actually it was because he interacted with a leper. And so now oh. he was like, now he was oh, carrying, carrying the stain of leprosy that he wouldn't have been allowed right. to go into these towns as well, because he, he was, he was so close. You know, it's like the story of the woman with the flow of blood who right. Jesus is on his way to go and heal somebody and she touches mm -hmm. him. And she doesn't mm -hmm. want to say that she touched him because she's actually made Rabbi Jesus unclean now. Right. And he can't go to the house of the head of the synagogue. Mm -hmm. now. You know, like that would be an unclean thing to do, but he does. But, you know, it's so he, he's doing this opposite thing that the people who would think of themselves as unclean and were thought of as unclean. He said, actually, right. I want them as close as possible. And I, so yeah. I think that's part of the blessing. And I, uh -huh. as I look through, and my book is really about the Beatitudes and Jesus's invitation into his Beatitude life mm -hmm. begins with that poverty of spirit, that, in, that mm -hmm. intentional awareness of humility. Mm -hmm. I can't do this. And finding mm -hmm. yourself in the position of the one who, who can't. Mm -hmm. But Jesus says, but I invite you in. And that's blessed. And it's mm -hmm. very difficult for us who've been in a place of privilege and power for a long time to actually mm -hmm. adopt that posture. Well, and I wonder if, for example, when I think about the descriptors here, you know, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, in some ways we are all poor, crippled, lame, and blind. It's just that those afflictions that we carry are often covered up mm -hmm. and we don't really um, openly display them. So maybe taking the position that this is me, you know, this is my reality this le levels the playing field yeah. in a radical way. Um, it, it does. And there are genuine socioeconomic realities oh, where certainly, I can walk yes. into anywhere. But if I genuinely attach myself mm -hmm. uh, to those who are poor, to those who are in those, those places, then it becomes more difficult for me to be invited mm. into those places. And you start mm. to begin to feel that level of ostracization and huh. and marginalization. And that's actually a really important thing as well. Um, you know, because we can spiritualize this poverty mm -hmm. and it's and it, there's a truth, mm -hmm. absolutely true what you say. Um, mm -hmm. But we still also know we've all still have the city walls around us. Right. You know? So right. actually going into those um, relationships with people. Uh -huh that can start to shift things in really uncomfortable ways that uh -huh. open us up to the reality of like, okay, well, Jesus hanging out with a leper meant that he was treated like a leper. Mm. So if you're going to hang out with a criminal, then mm -hmm. there are going to be people who will view you in that light. If you're going to hang out with, if you're going to hang out with, with, with women who ha are in, in sex work, then, you know, you're going to be perhaps seen in that light. If you're going to hang out with, I don't know, Democrats or Republicans or whatever it is, the, the, you know, the, mm -hmm. you know, whatever the opposite is, mm -hmm. you know, the, that's how you're going to start to be viewed and you'll start to be pushed away. And that's mm -hmm. actually kind of an important, you know, end result of the Beatitudes is blessed are you who are persecuted for the sake of righteousness, mm -hmm. um, because that's what's going to happen. That's what happens to peacemakers. Mm -hmm. And so you will find yourself in those places for real. I appreciate your saying that that's actually not something I had thought about. And I'm wondering, you know, if that took you by surprise when that happened to you. Um, I knew that theoretically. I had read enough to know mm -hmm. that that was, mm -hmm. in theory, the, the, tr the true thing that would happen. Mm -hmm. However, being in a, in a place of position and power, mm -hmm. you can insulate yourself from that an awful mm -hmm. lot mm -hmm. and you can also still have all the stories told about you and all the stories to carry around to great places mm -hmm. um you know and you can you can be a representative of the poor in lots of ways i mean this is the position mm -hmm. that i've had 
um, but not actually experience the pain and the right. the, um, the marginalization. Mm-hmm. And so, um, yeah, when you actually face it, like it's not fun, it's not good. And I've had little bits in little places here and there, and I still think there are all kinds of ways that I haven't accepted that full invitation into the poverty of spirit Mm. or as, or as Jesus says in Luke, just blessed are the poor. Mm -hmm. He doesn't say poor spirit, um, that I'm still learning and it's, Mm -hmm. it's still very, very hard. I don't think I ever really thought of Jesus as inviting me to rethink my position in this world as radically as you just suggested. I don't think I've ever been exposed to a message that is quite that demanding, Mm. if you will. And that has radical implications. I mean, I I think about the people who've given up their all for Jesus and say gone off to missionary work in far off places and live in really tough spaces and do things that I look at and go, I have no idea how they did that. But what you're talking about is something that is more rooted here and now. And and how would I live in this culture where there is definitely a big division between the haves and have-nots? As this fairly highly educated woman who has this bank account that isn't huge but is safe. And really think about how would re- Jesus invite me to go f- further in being radically committed to him and not afraid of mm-hmm. making changes. Mm-hmm. That's what your comments just prompted in me. And uh, quite honestly, it's very challenging. Well, and to me too. I, I, mm-hmm. I like to be very careful to say that the, the, anything I say that, I, that people receive is challenging. I've either mm-hmm. been wrestling with it or am still mm-hmm. wrestling with it or still mm-hmm. need to wrestle with it um, because it's never quite done. Uh, we've we've mm-hmm. put together... Of course, my friend Danielle and I put together a course called The Creative Way Down, Uh which is all through the Beatitudes. And it's an attempt to say, how do we, how do we follow Jesus downwards Uh into blessing? Uh And what we discover in the Beatitudes is the first Beatitude, blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The last Beatitude is blessed are those who are persecuted for the sake of righteousness for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. It's the same Uh blessing. And it sort of starts in the same place that it ends. And so we figure, Mm -hmm. oh, that probably means that it doesn't end. It's actually a spiral that you just keep on going and keep on going and keep on going deeper into the Mm -hmm. heart of Jesus, into the invitation of blessing. Mm -hmm. And that blessing, the word is makarios, and it actually suggests risen from the dead or united with Jesus, you know, Mm -hmm. are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. This is really an invitation not into just a socioeconomic reality. Mm -hmm. Um, Because if we're talking about that, then we could say, well, you know, what it could be socialism, Marx, whatever, you know, there's lots of different socioeconomic systems that we could try and pursue, but they're also not the fullness because it's, it's actually located in this person who is, who is God. Right. Who says, come into Mm -hmm. my life and find it blessed. Mm -hmm. And actually don't, it's not a burden because my burden is genuinely light. So come and find, find yourself in this place where I'm offering you this liberation and freedom. Um, but it is going to be challenging because it's, it does run in the face of everything, all the commitments that we've made in this world. Mm-hmm. And that, and, and that, that we've, person. go ahead. Yeah. No, I was just thinking all the quick commitments that we've been shown are important. That's right. That are the priorities yeah. for, you know, people with opportunities. And so it's a radical reshifting of how we view what real life is. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Can, yeah. can you repeat the name of your course? I yeah, I'd love to know more about it. It's called The Creative Way Down. And it is a three month course every day. So there's a a video every week where I do some teaching Mm. and then every single day there's some written content and practices to help people go deeper into this beatitude life. And you do that usually in a group, in a a cohort. Mm -hmm. 
where you try and go deeper and deeper and deeper. And it's when I when I find people who said I've done the whole course, I go, I'm I'm so sorry, uh, <laughs> because it's it is very intentional and it is it is very intense, because, mm -hmm. and it's meant to be. It's intentionally that uh, to mm -hmm. say we probably need some cold water to wake us up to the beauty that Jesus is offering us. But we've been mm -hmm. so comfortably numbed in, mm -hmm. in our, the world that it exists. And, mm -hmm. and part of what I was saying at the, the Justice Summit was my hope a little bit is that with some of the, even the stats that I mentioned, the, the fentanyl crisis and so on, it might wake us up to the reality that this is life and death stuff. Yeah. And, and the medicine that we seem to be offering which mm -hmm. we should have as the church, it doesn't seem to be strong enough for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. And so maybe it's we're not properly understanding or applying that medicine. Maybe we haven't fully received it because mm -hmm. it seems like this should be the kind of thing that will help. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that's my hope for myself and for my community, my family, and, and anyone I speak to is that mm -hmm. we would see the beauty of this so that it's the kind of thing we could offer to others. And what you're talking about is the beauty of the Beatitude life. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah. And one more question I have about your course is, is this a course that is best done with a group of people who are all trying to figure this out so you can kind of talk about it and the implications and hold each other accountable or mm -hmm. support each other through it? Very much so. People, yeah, they do it in groups. There's also an offer that... A, a group we're part of will um, kind of lead a cohort through, like help facilitate a cohort mm -hmm. through. Um, but and there are some individuals who've done it, but I don't necessarily recommend that because mm -hmm. it, there is an awful lot of accountability required in this. So mm -hmm. yeah, it is mm -hmm. best to do this in a group of people who are spiritually hungry. And and I'll say yeah. this too, you know, the re one of the reasons we we do this and and that I I try and live the way I live is I I've, I'm kind of tired. Mm. Of trying to of being in groups of people and trying to convince them, mm -hmm. and this often happens in the church, trying to convince them of mm -hmm. the goodness of this. So if I can find mm -hmm. a group of people who are already spiritually hungry, and mm -hmm. I don't particularly care if they're Christians yet or at all, mm -hmm. then mm -hmm. that's who I want to work with. And mm -hmm. there are people, there are non Christians who've taken this course and just, you know, met Jesus in wow. the midst of this, you know, quite challenging beatitude invitation. Right. So. Right. Yeah, it's got to be with people who are hungry for this. Yeah. Something more. I totally understand that. And and the prayer is, quite honestly, that the Holy Spirit and will lead us to find those people. Yeah. So that we can support one another and kind of say, admit, you know, I feel still like I only know a teeny tiny bit of what it is to really follow Jesus right. and to really understand the grace of God and his deep, deep compassion for me in this world. Mm -hmm. So um, I appreciate what you're saying and I deeply appreciate your honest sharing. I feel like I could have several more conversations with you and learn and be really touched and, and challenged in a good way. So thank you so much for spending time with us today and for sharing what you did at Kingdom Justice Summit. Highly encourage folks to check out your talk there and blessings on you and your journey.